All right, well, welcome back to our study in the book of Luke. Uh, we are continuing on today. We are in verses 26 through 45. Um, it's kind of a big section, but it's, it, you know, when you go through a narrative, it's a little bit different than going through um, one of the epistles. So the epistles are going to be a little bit shorter. We're going to go a little bigger chunks as we go through the Gospels. Um, so here in Luke, we're going to do about 20 verses today, and it's actually not that much if we go through and look at it. So if you guys want to read along with me, uh, I'll read this for you. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, and we'll go through 45. It says this. <clears throat> now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who, is, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. All right. So we are continuing through at the very beginning of Luke, right? And we're getting to see the picture uh, that God is laying out because he's bringing in the birth of the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus and uh, it coincides with the birth of John the Baptist. And what we see is that uh, Elizabeth is a relative of Mary. And so we believe that, uh, that these guys, uh, John the Baptist and Jesus, are cousins. Now, it's interesting because they don't seem to know each other very well when they do meet up uh, in their baptism. But they, they, there seems to be a, some sort of familiarity. But it makes sense because if John the Baptist is going to come in and be the precursor who is paving the way for the coming of Messiah... Well, they got to be right about the same age. And so there's a, there's a six-month difference that's going on there. Um, when you're kids, I think six months is a, is a huge amount. Obviously, when you get older, six months is like nothing, right? So um, there is a six-month difference there. So what we're looking at today is we're looking at the announcement of the, the coming of Jesus, which is really obviously important. This is what we're going to be celebrating uh, in Christmas when we come up just, to, you know, about a month and a half away. So uh, we want to look at that today, although we'll go back to it, obviously, when we get to Christmas time. Uh, but it is interesting what happens and some of the things that the angel Gabriel tells to Mary. All right? So as we pick up here, why don't we pick up in verse 26 and 27? We'll go through this, through this passage. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mariel. Mary. Sorry, um, You have uh, the angel Gabriel being sent. Now, the angel Gabriel was the same angel that went and spoke to Zacharias when he was in the temple serving. So uh, Gabriel's getting busy right here. He's got a lot of work to do. And he comes to speak to uh, Mary, and it says that Mary is betrothed 
to a man whose name was Joseph. So they're not married, and there was like a whole process that went on, an engagement process. Um, but typically what would go on is that they would, they would be betrothed, and then they would go through a process. And what would happen is that Zach, um, I'm sorry, Joseph would go, and he would be building a home for them to live in. And typically, this home would be attached to his parents' home. So they would add on like a wing onto the side of the building, right? Uh, we sometimes do that if we have a big property. Maybe you can have a property, something, you know, another house on the back of the property. That was kind of the same idea. But what his job was, was to make sure that he was able to provide a place for his new family to live once he got his bride. And if they had any kids coming on, um, that was very important that they had that space, right? So he's preparing that, but they have not been wed yet. They have not gone through this wedding feast, the whole process. And so this is a big deal because the angel comes to this virgin named Mary, right? This virgin. They are engaged. They are ready to get married, but they are not married yet. So what happens? Verse 28 and 29 says this, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. So imagine you're in a place and all of a sudden an angel appears to you out of nowhere, right? This is the same situation that Zacharias had. He goes in to burn the incense uh, at at the hour of prayer in the evening. He goes in there. He's supposed to be the only one in there. He goes in there and, whoa, there's a big old angel in there and he's talking to him like hey i've got a message for you so he was he was afraid well it says similar things it says that she went in she was troubled by this saying right all of a sudden an angel appears to her like where is she is she all by herself it seems like that doesn't say there's anyone else around so she's in there maybe she's in a room maybe she's i don't know doing something and all of a sudden this angel appears out of nowhere that would be terrifying, right? All of a sudden, someone comes in. Now, if you're one of those people who gets scared very easily, this could be even worse, right? So <laughs> we used to play games uh, where we try and scare each other. Uh, we've moved past that mostly since then um, because we thought, like, we're going to give each other heart attacks, you know? Um, but uh, I came home one time, and uh, she was hi- Lou was hiding in their kitchen, and it was like all the lights were off. And I was like, Lou, hello? And I came in, and she jumped out at me, and I screamed like a little girl, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's just terrifying. Now, if that was an angel and it was like, you know, they, it always sounds like angels are, you know, they look like humans in some way, shape or form. You know, if it seems like it's a man, that might be even scarier. I don't know. But she's in there and all of a sudden she's kind of um, scared, even though it was a friendly greeting. Now, notice what, what the angel says. He says, rejoice, highly favored one. You are highly favored of God. Now, that's something that sounds pretty good, Right. But what's coming to her is something that's going to be actually pretty heavy to carry, right? She's going to be pregnant with the Messiah, the chosen one of God. And she's going to have to, you know, really hold back her motherly instincts when Jesus is arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin and condemned and then brought before Pontius Pilate and then condemned off to be crucified. Like, this is brutal. This is all part of this blessing that's given to her at the beginning to be pregnant with Messiah. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, But he says, blessed are you among women. She's chosen to be doing something that's very special, bring forth the Messiah. So she's sitting there, she's considering what kind of greeting this is, and it's obviously troubling to her because she's trying to figure out what this is. Now, we don't know the age of Joseph and Mary, but there's a lot of speculation about that. And what most people believe is that Mary was actually pretty young. Uh, these, these women back in that time would get married much earlier. Um, they, she was probably a teenager. So we don't know if she was 14, 15, 16 years old, um, but she's betrothed to be married. And so Joseph was probably a little bit older. And then she's probably a teenager. And imagine a teenager seeing an angel and saying, hey, guess what? You're going to bring in the Messiah. You know, and you're like, what? What are you talking about? You know, I, I can't even imagine that kind of uh, speech coming my way to, to think about the responsibility that that would bring. And she's kind of trying to figure out how this thing is going to work, right? So that's what she's going to talk about. Look at verse 30 and 31. It says, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So uh, we go through here and we talk about... Um, how she has received favor from the Lord. And this is, again, he said the the same thing earlier in the passage. So this is a blessing that is brought to her 
to be able to bring forth Messiah, okay? Uh, I think that's pretty special. I, I'm sure, again, it brings a huge responsibility, but it is something that's really special for her. And he says, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So this kind of gets into really important prophecies. So if you guys are turning with me to Isaiah, uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah 7, verse 14, it says this. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? Now, most of you probably have heard that. Emmanuel means God with us. So, she's, so the prophecy in the book of Isaiah, this is almost 750 years before the birth of Jesus, right? They, they're coming and they're saying, there's going to be a virgin. She's going to conceive. She's going to have a son. And we're going to call that son Emmanuel, God with us, okay? Now, it doesn't say that you're going to call him Emmanuel. What it says is you're going to name him Jesus, right? The name Jesus is also extremely significant because in the, it comes from the Hebrew. The Hebrew name is Yeshua. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation, okay? Yahweh is salvation. And so when you're going through and you're looking at that, like your name means that God is salvation, that's significant, right? So when they're talking about Jesus, he's the one that's gonna bring salvation for the people. He's the one that is going to come to actually provide atonement for sins. It's only through his death and resurrection. So the naming of Jesus is extremely important. It's not, I'll name him whatever, name him Joseph Jr. No, 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 it's Jesus. It's Yeshua, Joshua, right? So this is extremely important that we understand that. Now, as you go through, this is also connected with another prophecy in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter nine, which you guys should be familiar with, verse six and seven. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David, and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you have these two famous prophecies that are given to us in Isaiah. And these are prophecies talking about the coming, the birth of a very important son that's going to be king over Israel. You'll notice the language that it uses here in verse six. It says that there's gonna be a child born, it's gonna be a son and it says the government will be upon his shoulders. Now he expands upon that in verse seven because he begins to talk about how he will reign upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and that he is going to reign over it and establish it in judgment and justice. So this is really important. This is gonna be a very important child who will reign as king. But then he also describes him. He says his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. And there's a little bit of debate because when this was written, there was no punctuation. So we don't know if it's wonderful, comma, counselor, or if it's wonderful counselor, okay? You could be either way. I think they're both true, um, but you could, we can debate that afterwards. But then it also says, mighty God, okay? Not only is he gonna be a king that's gonna reign on the throne of David, but we're gonna call him the mighty God, okay? Mighty God, that's a, that's, that's a huge title. That would be blasphemy, Right? Blasphemy. Jesus, what we're going to see, that they're going to tell him he's called the son of God. Jesus was condemned by the Sanhedrin for saying that he was the son of God. Why? Because that's a title of God. But now to say that he's going to be mighty God, that's even bigger, right? So this is very important. They're saying this child that will be born is going to be incredibly significant to the nation of Israel and obviously to the whole world. Now, it doesn't stop there at mighty God because then it calls him the everlasting father. And you're like, everlasting father? What? So he's gonna be like an eternal being? And then he says he's gonna be also the prince of peace. Now, we could probably just go on and on about this verse um, because there's so much in these two verses here. Uh, but, but what we're seeing is the significance of this child. So when the angel comes and says, hey, guess what? you're going to have a baby, and this baby is going to be very, very important, he's pointing to these things. He's pointing to the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, and this one here in chapter 9, and he's showing God is about to fulfill all these prophecies that were written about 750 years prior, 
We, people have been waiting. They've been looking for Messiah. There were people who claimed to be Messiah, but now he's coming and he's telling Mary, Mary, this is it, okay? Prepare yourself because you're gonna be a part of this adventure that's gonna come with Messiah. Okay, now if we go back to the passage to verse um, 30 and 31, he says that not only is he gonna be called Jesus, Yahweh is salvation, but he says he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That's what we saw in Isaiah chapter nine. He said he's gonna sit on the throne of David and he's gonna set everything in order for the kingdom of Israel. So this is gonna be a very important man that he's going to reign over the kingdom of David. And you see that there is a connection there of the lineage of David. Now, we're, we're gonna see this, we'll talk about this maybe later on, uh, but if you go through and you look through the gospels, what you'll see is that both Joseph and Mary are both from the lineage of David. And that's, that's important because we have to see that Jesus is a physical descendant of David in order to sit on the throne of David, and then he'll be given the authority directly from God to be that king, okay? Um, let's continue on. Uh, look at verse 32 and 33. Well, actually, actually I was kind of going into that, wasn't I? Uh, he says, uh, he will be great and the highest, even throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom, there will be no end, okay? So he's going to reign forever. There will be no end of his kingdom. Now we look at that and we say, wait a minute, no, Jesus isn't here anymore. He's not reigning, right? Well, he does reign in a certain sense. One of the things that we see is that the kingdom of God is within us, Okay, we'll talk about that later on in the book of Luke. The kingdom of God is within us. Very, very important. But even beyond that, what we're going to see is we're going to see Jesus return and he is going to come back as a conquering king. He's going to ride in on the white horse. He's going to have the sword coming out of his mouth. He's going to wipe out all of his enemies. In doing this, what is he going to do? He's going to establish his kingdom on earth. He's going to reign. And what we'll see is what we believe is the millennial kingdom. He's going to reign for a thousand years. And we see different pictures of it throughout the Bible where we see where a child is playing in a a snake's uh, den that, that the ox and the bear and the lion are all grazing together. There's going to be peace on earth as Jesus sets up his thousand year reign in the book of Revelation. So he's going to reign, but then we're going to see that that kingdom will never end. It's going to be an eternal kingdom. Why? Because all of us who are a part of that kingdom will depart from this world. We will go to heaven. We will be in the new Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to reign over everything that exists over the entire universe. He's going to reign over those who are in heaven, those who are in hell. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. It's going to be truly an eternal kingdom kingdom for everlasting and everlasting. So this is so important that we understand this. It didn't happen the way that the Jews thought it would, but it's still going to happen. Okay. The Jews thought when Messiah comes, he's going to come and he's going to conquer the world. At that point, it was the Romans that were in charge. So he's going to wipe out the Romans. When the Romans are conquered, now Israel will reign. The Messiah will never die. He'll reign forever. And we are going to control the whole world. That didn't happen. That's not how it was going to work. So no, no, I'm coming the first time in order to bring salvation. Remember my name, Jesus, Yahweh is salvation. He said, I'm going to come do that. Then when I return, then I'm going to set up my kingdom and we're going to reign forever and ever. And so that's why when Jesus had resurrected, his disciples are there and they're like, oh, hey, Lord, is this the time now that you're going to set up your kingdom? You know, because they're like, I'm going to be on his right hand. I'm going to be on his left hand. We're going to be right there with them. This is going to be great. And he's like, no, 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 it's not for you guys to understand the times and the seasons that the father has control over. He's like, just just wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, right? So he's telling them, hey, this is not the time. This is not it, not yet. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do some amazing things. Now, when Jesus actually ascended and everyone's standing there and they're looking up and they're looking, he goes up in the clouds. Next thing they know, there's two guys there in white, seem to be angels, and they're telling him, hey, why are you looking up? into the clouds. Hey, Jesus, the the same way he went up, you're going to see him come back, but you need to go into Jerusalem and wait, right? And so he's saying, it's it's not right now. He's going to come back. And so they're like, okay, when's he coming back? And that's what we're waiting for right now, right? We're waiting for the return of Jesus to set up this 
everlasting kingdom of which there will be no end. So this is really exciting stuff. Um, one of the things that we see about him is, you guys will turn with me to Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 36 and 37. It says this. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. So here he was talking about the kingdom of David again. And he says that his seed shall endure forever. His throne is going to be like the sun and like the moon. Okay? The sun's there every day. Never goes away. Right? We see the moon. It's been here for centuries, millennium, right? This, the moon doesn't go away. It's always there. He says, that's how David's kingdom is going to be. And it says, his seed shall endure forever. His descendants, some, one of his descendants is going to do this. And that's Jesus. That's the connection. Now, there are all sorts of prophecies that talk about this. It's just one of them. But it shows that the lineage of David, someone is going to reign forever. And that's never going to end, and it's going to be the most amazing thing. We see pictures of it all throughout the prophets. Uh, one of them that I think about, even in the book of Daniel, which I was going to put in here, but it's so long, the story. You guys remember the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he has this dream. And he dreams about the statue. And there's a statue with the head of gold and the shoulders of chest of silver. And it goes down, it's, it's bronze, and then it, uh, iron, and then iron mixed with clay. And what happens is there's a mountain that is, came out not... Uh, it's, it's like a giant rock that's not hewn with, with man's hands. And it's thrown at the feet of the statue. And the, the pieces of the statue are broken apart and it's blown away and they're all taken out. And he says, then that, that rock became a, a kingdom that lasted forever and ever. And you're like, what? Lasted, how'd that happen? It was God. They're saying, something's gonna come in. God's gonna come in like a giant mountain. He's gonna destroy all the kingdoms of the earth and he's going to reign forever and ever. Even in the book of Daniel, we're seeing little pictures of this. There, there's pictures of it all throughout the Bible. A descendant of David will reign forever. So what's he doing? The angel's coming. He's talking to Mary and he's saying, this is it. All those prophecies, all the different pictures that we see of the coming Messiah, of the, the throne of David, of this eternal kingdom, it's all going to be fulfilled in this child that you're going to bear. Now imagine Mary, this teenager sitting there going, oh my gosh, what is this? What is happening to me? It, it probably was incredibly overwhelming to think about everything that she was going to go through. So jump back to the passage. Um, let's go to verse 34 and 35. It says, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So she's just being rational. She's like, ah, a little complicated here. Uh, how do I have this baby if I've never been with a man? Okay, it's kind of hard to do, Right? Like, we've all been through those stories, the birds and the bees. We know how it works, right? So she's bringing up a very important point here. How is this going to work? And uh, the angel says very simply, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. So you have this idea, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon him. And then this idea of overshadowing you is to, um, to throw a shadow upon, to envelop, or to overshadow. So... The idea of envelop is kind of like to wrap around, like the, the Holy Spirit is going to do something supernatural. The Holy Spirit is going to do something supernatural. That's, that's the only way to say it, right? So she's like, how's this going to happen? He says, don't worry. God's going to take care of this. God's going to do something supernatural that you can't understand, but the Holy Spirit is going to come and plant a seed, and it's going to be Messiah, right? And so he says, therefore, the Holy One that's going to be born to you is going to be called the Son of God, right? Now, when we get to the end of Luke, what we're going to see, Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin. And they're like, tell us now, tell us plainly. And then they're talking, they have a conversation. And then they said, okay, so are you the son of God? And he said, you know, and it's, there's all his words. We'll go through it. But it's, he says basically, yes. And they said, okay, what further testimony do we need? Right? He's blaspheming is what they're saying. Put him to death. And that's why they take him from there. And they take him right to Pontius Pilate. And they said, okay, here's this guy. He's guilty. Put him to death. And Pontius Pilate's like, wait, wait, wait. What's going on here? This isn't right. There, there's something missing here. He's kind of, he's intuitive enough to know like, this isn't right. And he goes and he talks to Jesus. And he's like, no, there, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. 
He hasn't done anything wrong. And they're like, no, no, according to our law, he has blasphemed and he deserves to die. And so then all of a sudden he's like, wait a minute, what's going on? Who are you? You know, we'll get to that later on. Um, But very, very important that we understand this, okay? Jesus claiming to be the son of God was put up for death as a blasphemer. So when the angel comes and says, hey, guess what? This holy one's gonna be born to you is gonna be called the son of God. You go, oh. So they're actually saying that he is God. This is a claim to deity. Being the son of God is not less than God. It's actually a title of God. That's why the Jews said he's guilty of blasphemy. He must be put to death. It's very important that we understand that. Remember, the groups like the Jehovah's Witness are gonna come around and they're gonna say, no, no, Jesus never claimed to be God. It's like, are you kidding me? Have you read the gospel of John? Have you gone through and seen the things that he said? You see how they picked up stones to throw at him several times for blasphemy? How can you say that? No, no, no. He claimed to be the son of God. That's different than it's God and then he's God's son. It's less than, and it's like, no, what they're doing is they're trying to use their mind in today's day and age and they're trying to apply their logic of what the son of God must mean to them to what it meant in the first century. You can't do that. You have to look at the historical context. The historical context says, if someone claims to be the son of God, they're blaspheming. It's, it's blasphemy. And so we have to put them to death. So this is a very, very serious thing. So when the angel comes in and says, hey, this is gonna be the son of God, Mary's like, whoa, this is big. Now, she probably has heard multiple times the prophecies that we, we saw already in Isaiah chapter seven and Isaiah chapter nine. She probably knows them. She probably knows that it says, it says, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace about this, this baby. And now I'm gonna have that. I, I, I imagine eventually this is gonna go through her head and she's gonna start to put the pieces together if it's not right now. So Mary has this huge burden that's put upon her, but the angel is laying this all out. This is not your ordinary baby not by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, now, um, one, oh, one other thing, we wanna say this. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter one, verse five. Hebrews chapter one, verse five is talking about Jesus, and it says this. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So you have these cool prophecies that are written about Jesus, and it says very clearly that he's talking to Jesus and that Jesus is greater than the angels, and he says that he's calling Jesus his son and that he said, I'm gonna be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. There is an intimate relationship there that he's showing here in the fulfillment in Hebrews chapter one. Pretty cool stuff. All right, back to the passage again. Verse 36 and 37, no, Yes, 36 and 37. It says, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Okay, so saying Elizabeth is six months in, that's what we saw at the very beginning in verse 26. It says in the sixth month, and it was right after we saw that um, Elizabeth was rejoicing last week about being pregnant. Um, But he says, hey, listen, your relative, uh, Elizabeth, she's got a baby in her old age. It's a miracle, right? And you're a virgin, but you're gonna have a baby. It's gonna be a miracle. And he, he just wraps this all up with the most perfect little statement, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. This is fantastic. Nothing? So what is it that we need God to do for us? What, what is it that you need right now? If you think about some things, okay, God, I, need, I, I got a situation here. I'm having a problem here. Maybe it's a health problem. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's a spiritual problem, right? Maybe you're, you're battling with some sin. Maybe, maybe there's something serious going on, right? What do you need help from God for, okay? Should be in your head. Now, whatever that is, it's obviously in the realm of possibility for God to do that. Nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. Now, if he can make a teenage girl pregnant who's never been with a man, God can do whatever it is that you need him to do, right? If he can make an older lady who's past the age of childbearing, right? Who, who, who physically cannot get pregnant, makes her get pregnant with John the Baptist of all kids, right? This is an amazing kid. He can do whatever it is that you need him to do. And this is not just something that we see in the New Testament, in fact. If you guys would turn with me to uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. Fantastic verse here. It says this. Ah, Lord God, behold, 
You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arms. arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Man, this is awesome. There is nothing too hard for you, right? He says it right there. It's in the Old Testament too. This isn't something new. It's not like all of a sudden the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. No, it's the same God. He does the same things. And so in the Old Testament, there's nothing too hard for him. In the New Testament, there's nothing impossible for him. It's the same God. And so that should bring encouragement to us because we look at this and say, well, he was the same in the Old Testament. He's the same in the New Testament. He's the same right now. We saw this as we were going through on Sunday mornings. We saw that there is no changing in God. He is immutable. And what does that mean? Well, we see that he does amazing works back in the Old Testament. He can still do them today. We see he does in the New Testament. He can still do them today. Now, what we do is we start to have problems with our faith. And we start to doubt the God of the Bible. The one for which nothing is impossible. Why do we do that? Well, got a verse for you. Turn with me to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3. Proverbs 19, verse 3 says this, The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. Okay? It's our foolishness that gets in the way. He says our foolishness comes in, starts to twist our ways, and then we start to worry against the Lord. Man, well, that's not what we're supposed to do. In fact, the New Testament tells us not to worry about anything, nothing. He says, bring everything with prayer and thanksgiving before God, and he's going to give you the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It's fantastic. But he says, this is what we do. God is capable of doing anything, anything. And then we come in and we go, oh, no, I don't know. Not in my situation. No, it's never going to work. How are we ever? I can't even think about a solution. How is this ever going to happen? And we've all done this. We start to rationalize in our mind human incapabilities, right? We, I, there's no way it's humanly possible. And then we start to apply that to God as if God was a human and had his hands tied and was unable to do things. That's not God. That's not the God of the Bible. God is huge. So what we have to do is we have to take that worry when we start to worry, and go, oh no, this is impossible and give it over to God and say, okay, God, what do you want to do here? All right? God, help me. Right? And when we go through, like it says in Philippians, and we give thanks and we pray with supplication and prayer and we let our requests be made known to God. And then he brings his peace upon us. Now, I don't know if you guys have done that before, but it's really quite wild. I've been in situations that were really horrible and all of a sudden I'm praying, I'm, I'm desperate. God, help me. I don't know how to do this. Please. And then all of a sudden this peace comes upon me and I'm like, okay, he didn't give me an answer, but all of a sudden I have this peace that surpasses understanding. Well, I, I shouldn't have peace right now. And then I, okay, well, let's go to bed. Okay. I mean, I don't know. There's nothing else I can do, right? I just have to wait for God to work. And, and this is a big step, right? Because I'm just trying to, to trust him. But it's our foolishness that gets in the way of God. Our foolishness, right? Our stress, our earthly mind trying to find solutions. You know how many times I've been through and it's like, well, this situation, well, it could end like this or maybe like this or maybe like this, Right? And then there's some other option that I never even thought of, and that's how it happened. I'm like, huh, I never thought of that, right? Why? Because I'm stupid. I'm a, I'm a human. I've got no capability. And God's like, huh, you think you're so smart. I'll do something you never even thought of, right? Because that's how big God is. So we go through and we talk about Mary. How can she have a baby? Nothing's impossible for God. Elizabeth, how can she have a baby? Nothing is impossible with God. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. If you guys are in Steve's Sunday school class, you guys should have gone through that in Ephesians chapter three. And this is really big. He can do more than we can ask or think. Man, I can think of some pretty good things. God can do exceedingly, abundantly above that. Above what I can even think of? Yeah, that's how big our God is. You know, this is why we're, we're doing this series on Sunday mornings on foundations because we want you to see how big God is. Okay, and then we want to see that, hey, you know what? It's actually us that limits the power of God because of our foolishness. We start to worry. We start to be concerned and we're not trusting in the Lord, right? So we need to trust in this God who is so huge, so vast. He can do anything, even cause these ladies to get pregnant when it's physically impossible, right? So what is the conclusion here? Back to the passage, verse 38. It says, then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. 
And the angel departed from her. So she just basically rejoices. She's like, all right, well, if nothing's impossible to God, then praise the Lord, right? Let it be according to your word. And you see a a bit of a contrast here from what we saw from Zacharias. Zacharias is like, oh, come on. Uh, We're we're past age, you know, how's this ever going to happen? And she's just like, hey, let it be according to your word. Praise the Lord, you know? She's celebrating what the angel said. So you see a difference. Zacharias went mute for the better part of almost a year, right? Mary, blessed, highly favored of the Lord, God pouring out blessings upon her life, and she goes off rejoicing in the Lord for what he's doing. Man, pretty awesome. Now, we can obviously look at this and say, well, which one do we want to be, right? Obvious, we want to be like Mary, and that's why, obviously, some churches have exalted Mary to a point that she shouldn't have been exalted to, but it, it doesn't mean that Mary was a horrible person uh, just because there is a, a twisting of the doctrine of Mary. We just want to look at her and say, okay, what did she do? She had great faith. This young gal had great faith and just believed and raised Messiah. Pretty amazing. All right, so we move into the next part, um, starting in verse 39, and we start to see that she goes off to visit Elizabeth, her relative. We don't know exactly what it is. Imagine it's an aunt or something, but we're not sure. So look at verse 39 through 41. It says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, So the angel told her, your relative Elizabeth has a baby. She's in her sixth month. And she's like, oh my gosh. And so she's like, I gotta go. And so she goes up from Nazareth all the way to Judah and makes this trip to go visit her aunt or cousin or whatever this is, uh, some sort of relative, Elizabeth, right? So she comes in there. She comes to the house of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And it says that when she come in, Elizabeth heard her. So Mary comes in the house, greeting. She's excited. And then the baby, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, okay? So this is obviously remarkable because this is not what happens typically when a baby's moving around, right? You guys have all probably done that. You put your hand when the baby's in there and you see the baby's like kind of doing a, you know, Tybo lesson in, in, you know, inside the womb and just punching when you're like, whoa, look at, oh, there's another one, you know, and the baby's like kicking and doing all this stuff. Um, that, that's what happens. Now, this baby jumps for joy. What is that like? I don't know. But whatever it was, the end result is that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it's like, they said John the Baptist was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, right? So it seems like the Holy Spirit is now gone from John into his mother, and it's just like spreading the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Uh, it's very strange, because at this point, the Holy Spirit has not been given like it has in the New Covenant, like we have today. Um, but this is something that's very significant to see Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit as a result of this. But it's funny that somehow God is working in there, that the baby knows Mary and is excited about that and that the Holy Spirit is working in the situation, right? So just kind of a, a bizarre thing, yet they're, they're relatives. And so how would a baby know that there's a relative visiting? I don't know, unless it's working, unless it's a work of the Holy Spirit, of course. So uh, really interesting. Um, Continue on. Verse 42 and 43. It says, Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So she's speaking blessings on to Mary, and uh, this is kind of cool. This word blessed that she uses in verse 42 both times, it, it just means happy, right? Happy. That's one of the meanings of blessing. So he says, she said, happy are you among women. Like, you're blessed. You're so happy. And, and happy is the fruit of your womb. Now, how does Elizabeth know that Mary is pregnant? I don't know. It doesn't tell us how she knows. She's right at the beginning, right? So it, it doesn't seem like she wouldn't be showing. Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting thing that she knows. And she says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And so somehow... I don't know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking through her since she's filled with the Holy Spirit, but there, there is something going on that Elizabeth knows exactly what's happening with Mary after Mary knows only because an angel told her, right? So this is an interesting dynamic that's going on there. It's like, wow, this is kind of the supernatural thing that's happening. 
and, and the Holy Spirit is working and speaking through the baby and through this situation. But Elizabeth knows that she is the mother of my Lord. And you go, wow, that's kind of bizarre. Now, one of the things that we see is that Jesus is called Lord all throughout the New Testament, right? Lord was a common title, but this Lord is very important. This is the word kurios in the Greek. And the word kurios talks about someone who is an owner or a master or a Lord, like we kind of had Lord and ladies, right, back in, you know, the medieval times. So this is someone that had great possessions, someone that was influential, someone that would be telling you what to do. So if you had a Lord on your property, they would tell you, hey, uh, I want you going out there. I want you to plow this side of the field today. And you don't say, you know, I don't think that's a good idea because they're your Lord. You just say, yes, sir. You know, yes, ma'am, whatever, whatever it is, you're going to show respect because they are the Lord. So she understands the significance of the baby that's coming to uh, Mary even though, again, I don't think there's any sign of life at this point. Uh, I don't know if she's even conceived. I don't know if the Holy Spirit has done that already or not. We don't know. But it's at the very beginning she still understands, your baby is going to be my Lord. You go, wow, this is heavy stuff, right? So got to think about that. One of the things that we talk about is that Jesus is our Lord. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why we see in most of the epistles, we kind of talked about this as we went through Romans, is that uh, the apostles, not all of them, but many times they'll say, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And the bond servant was someone who was a servant by choice for life with a certain master. So what, they're, what are they saying? They're saying, he is my Lord. He is my master. And so when you have a master, you, again, you don't say, no, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. What you do is whatever they tell you to do, whatever they tell you to do. And so that's kind of our relationship with Jesus in a certain sense. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, there's a certain sense that he's our brother under God the Father. But then there's another sense that he is our Lord. And so we're looking to do his will, whatever he tells us, right? So kind of interesting stuff. Okay, last two verses, verse 44 and 45. It says, for indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord, okay? So uh, you have this idea of being blessed, right? Um, And uh, very, very important that she is going to be, she's like, happy uh, is she who believed. I messed that up, I'm sorry. I spoke incorrectly, I got these words mixed up. So verse 42 is not happy. Verse 45 is the one that's happy, happy, is she who believed. I'm sorry, verse 42 actually means to cause to prosper or to be favored of God. I'm sorry about that. I mixed that one up. Um, So in verse 42, she says, blessed are you among women. You are favored of God, cause to prosper. Um, Blessed is the fruit of your womb, cause to prosper, favored of God, right? And then in verse 45, she says, blessed is she who believed, which is happy, Okay, sorry about that. I mixed that up Um, in my notes. I I read the wrong thing. So um, she says, you are happy because you believed, right? You are happy because you believed. Now, we see this another time, which is very important. Turn with me to to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we see the story of Thomas uh, in verse 29. It says this. He says, and Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, blessed are those who have not seen. That's us. That's us. I didn't see Jesus. I don't know. Did you guys see Jesus? You guys saw the hands, handprint as well? I didn't see that. I mean, that was centuries ago, right? Okay, but what does he say? He says, blessed, happy. Happy is he who are those who believe even though they haven't seen. Okay, that comes to us. That's pretty awesome, right? So it says, Mary, you're gonna be blessed. Thomas, hey, you're doing great, Thomas, because you believe, but imagine how much better are those who have not seen and yet believed. So kind of a cool thing, kind of a cool little connection we make there. So this passage, very, very simple. Next week, we will look at this, like Mary's basically gonna like praise God in the next section. And and it's almost like a, a, I don't know if it's a poem or a song, I don't know, but she's gonna do this awesome little thing. And there's all sorts of, Uh, rich ideas in there. We don't have time to go through that today. But we just get to see, this is the blessing that God is pouring out upon his people through Mary. Mary is highly favored of the Lord. Uh, God's grace is upon her. This is amazing. That's awesome. We want to respect her. Um, Obviously, we don't want to lift her up to the level of co-redemptress, which is what happens in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, That's not biblical at all. 
okay? But we want to make sure that we do pay respect. So what happens is um, down in Brazil, for example, there was so much idolatry, especially around Mary, that there was a, a pastor one time who was on TV, and he got this statue of Mary, and got out a sledgehammer, and smashed it in front of everyone and said, this is terrible. And then he had to leave because then there were massive death threats around him. He had to go into hiding for a while and get police protection, right? You don't need to do that. You don't need to break uh, statues of Mary and blaspheme her and everything. We don't need to do that. But we do need to keep her in her proper place, right? She's not the co-redemptress. She was the mother of Jesus, which is fantastic, right? And that gets into a huge debate from church history. Um, But we still praise her because she believed God and received those promises knowing that nothing is impossible with God. And then we can be just like that, highly favored of God. Why? Because we believed, blessed of God, happy because we believed without seeing. We can be just like Mary in that sense, right? And so we want to look at that and say, okay, what can we learn from Mary? This is what we can learn. She believed with the purest, most beautiful heart and the simplicity in her faith. And that's what we want to do too, right? Whatever it is that you need, God can do it. God can do it. So we want to trust him for that. So let's pray. And if you guys have any questions or you guys need any prayer, we'll we'll do that afterwards. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful passage and the announcement of the birth of Jesus. And uh, thank you for Mary who just received that in such amazing faith uh, that she was so young and yet just had such amazing character and such great faith to be able to to go through this whole process. And so uh, we thank you for that. So Father, help us. Help us to increase our faith tonight, knowing that nothing is impossible for you, knowing that we can be blessed since we have not seen you, and yet we still believe. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide us, that we would just grow all the more in faith through this message and and through the examples that we see. Please guide us and bless our week as we finish up here. In Jesus' name, amen.